It's been about 13 years ago now that Mel Gibson wrote and directed the movie entitled The Passion of the Christ. Some of you saw it at that time. Some of you have seen it since then. And you know that it was not an easy movie to watch. Before it was released to theaters, Gibson went on somewhat of a tour, some of the major churches, mega churches in this country, where he showed a screening of the movie, and then afterwards he did a Q&A session with a moderator on stage. Anita and I attended the one down in Orange County at Saddleback Church, and it was a very interesting event, especially the question and answer session afterwards, after having been profoundly affected by the movie. Another place where he did the same kind of event was at Willow Creek Community Church in South Barrington, Illinois. It was there at that place that the then editor of Christianity Today magazine, David Neff, asked Gibson a question. He asked Gibson what he made of the unseen world. <clears throat> Pardon me, the unseen world. What he made of the supernatural. What he thought of such realities. I want to read you Gibson's answer to that question. It was brief, but interesting. He said, well, that's the big picture, isn't it? The big realms are slugging it out. We're just the meat in the sandwich. And for some reason, we're worth it. I don't know why, but we are. I was struck by that one line, the big realms are slugging it out because it implies that there's an unseen battle, something beyond the vision of the naked human eye. That there is a place where there is very large power on one side and very large power on the other side facing off. The big realms are slugging it out. I don't know what biblical text, if there was one, was the basis for what Gibson had to say. But the truth is, if you were looking for a text on which to base that statement, you probably could not find a better text than Daniel chapter 10. Daniel chapter 10 is our chapter today. It is really part of a three-chapter section, the fourth and the final vision of Daniel. Daniel chapters 10, 11, and 12. Much too much material to cover in one sermon. Today we look at chapter 10, which really is the introductory piece to the last vision of Daniel. I'll tell you right up front, this chapter will leave us with more questions than it answers. I've spent now quite a number of hours with this chapter and still have many questions for which I don't have answers and may never have them. But I do believe there are certain insights that grow out of the chapter that can be beneficial to us as we study. But first, a word of background and then a word about what to watch for when we read. The word of background is this. Daniel has been in exile long enough now that his people have actually journeyed back, some of them, to Jerusalem and have begun the rebuilding of the temple. Not all the exiles have returned, but some have. Daniel has not returned. We assume it's probably because of his advancing age. He still hasn't gone home. But the rebuilding back home is not going all that well. There are discouragements that are arising. In the midst of all this, Daniel is given a vision that deeply distresses him. It's a vision that has to do with the future of his people and the future of this planet. So that's the context. Now, as we read Daniel chapter 10, I want to ask you to take note of three realities. The first thing to notice is just take note of the unseen battle. The fact that this chapter confesses that there is something going on that we as human beings are not able to see in which we directly cannot participate. Take note of that in the chapter. And then secondly, take note of what happens behind the scenes as Daniel prays. Because when Daniel prays, something happens of which he is unaware. Notice that. And then finally, take notice of the emotional imagery, the emotional language, the emotional events that sweep over Daniel as this chapter unfolds. 
So notice those three things. Unseen battle, what happens behind the scenes when Daniel prays, and the emotions by which he is affected. So we begin reading in Daniel 10 and verse 1. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a revelation was given to Daniel who was called Belteshazzar. Its meaning was true, and it concerned a great war. The understanding of the message came to him in a vision. At that time, I, Daniel, mourned for three weeks. I ate no choice food, no meat or wine touched my lips, and I used no lotions at all until the three weeks were over. On the 24th day of the first month, I was standing on the bank of the great river, the Tigris. I looked up, and there before me was a man dressed in linen with a belt of fine gold from Euphaz around his waist. His body was like topaz, his face like lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and his voice like the sound of a multitude. If you've read Revelation lately, you recognize a similar imagery in Revelation describing Jesus. Verse 7, I, Daniel, was the only one who saw the vision. Those who were with me did not see it, but such terror overwhelmed them that they fled and hid themselves. So I was left alone gazing at this great vision. I had no strength left. My face turned deathly pale, and I was helpless. Then I heard him speaking, and as I listened to him, I fell into a deep sleep, my face to the ground. A hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. He said, Daniel, you who are highly esteemed, consider carefully the words I'm about to speak to you and stand up, for I have been sent now to you. And when he said this to me, I stood up trembling. Then he continued, do not be afraid, Daniel. Since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come in response to them. But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. Now I have come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the future, for the vision concerns a time yet to come. While he was saying this to me, I bowed with my face toward the ground and was speechless. Then one who looked like a man touched my lips, and opened my, I opened my mouth and began to speak. I said to the one standing before me, I'm overcome with anguish because of the vision, my Lord, and I feel very weak. How can I, your servant, talk with you, my Lord? My strength is gone, and I can hardly breathe. Again, the one who looked like a man touched me and gave me strength. Do not be afraid, you who are highly esteemed, he said. Peace. Be strong now. Be strong. When he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, Speak, my Lord, since you have given me strength. So he said, Do you know why I have come to you? Soon I will return to fight against the prince of Persia, and when I go, the prince of Greece will come. But first I will tell you what is written in the book of truth. No one supports me against them except Michael, your prince. And in the first year of Darius the Mede, I took my stand to support and protect him. Wow. It creates many questions, many queries and quandaries. But of one thing, we can be confident. The confession of this chapter of Daniel is that there is an unseen battle, an unseen world, where things unfurled and fighting rages that affects our planet of which we are unaware. That's the claim of the chapter. In fact, let me read you two brief statements, I think just a sentence each from two different commentaries writing about this chapter. First one says, there is no clearer evidence than this chapter on the concept that conflicts in human history are paralleled by conflicts in the supernatural realm. Second one from the SDA Bible Commentary, in this chapter, as perhaps nowhere else in Scripture, the veil that separates heaven from earth is drawn aside, and the struggle between the powers of light and darkness is revealed. So that much is clear. 
We know that the chapter is saying this is a moment when the veil gets pulled aside, the curtain gets open, and we get just a bit of a glimpse into a different world where an unseen battle rages that has to do with us. That's why I say I don't know what verse and chapter, if he was, Mel Gibson was quoting, but it might well have been this. The question is, what does that mean to us? What does that mean to our day-to-day -day living? How does this chapter apply in any way to our lives? As I said, some questions remain, but I think there are three insights that might apply. Insight number one, I would say this way. Our struggles are more spiritual than we would have thought. Our struggles are more spiritual than we would have thought. The truth is, when we get involved in struggles, it's usually because there is some other person on the end of that. Could be a roommate back at the dorm, a colleague at the hospital, could be the spouse with whom we live, could be a country around the planet. But there's somebody on the other end of that which we think if that person could just be dealt with, if I could just take care of that person, if they could just see it in a different way, if they could change, I would be better. Somebody said to me one day, speaking of a situation where there was a lot of complexity, said this to me, you know what? There's nothing here that two or three good funerals wouldn't fix. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. That's where we turn when things go wrong. We've got to deal with them. And then along comes Daniel. And for him, the, the screen is pulled back. And he suddenly realizes our struggles are more spiritual than I would have ever have thought. Now, this is not alone in Scripture as a passage to speak of such things. In fact, you will find similar things in the New Testament, just statements that are made, assumptions that are made with no explanation, but which call into mind this reality. For example, Paul. Paul the apostle writing his first letter to his friends in the church at ancient Thessalonica. He's writing to them about the desire that he has had. In fact, he and his colleagues have had to go and visit that church. And when he writes, he says to them, we have wanted to come to you before now, but Satan blocked us. What did Paul mean by that? He gives no explanation, doesn't unpack the realities, just makes that statement. Our struggles are more spiritual than we might ever have thought. Or what about Paul in Ephesians, one of my favorite Pauline epistles. When you get into the second half of that epistle, you see that Paul is writing all kinds of relational advice. He's giving relational directives. He talks about how we are to handle conflict, how we are to communicate, how we are to deal with anger, how we are to do in our work relationships, what we are to do in our home relationships. He unpacks all kinds of realities which have to do with our relational lives, the very kinds of situations in which we often find ourselves in those struggles. And then he comes to the end of that section, and he makes this statement. Just as we're thinking, we can fix this. It's just you and me, and you're really the problem. Then he says this. Remember, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against spiritual forces of darkness in high places. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. So if you were thinking, that other person is the problem, if I could just attend their service, everything would be fine. Paul says, wait a minute, just a moment. It's a spiritual battle. It's so easy to think that our problem is south of the border or north of the border or around the world or somewhere like that. But what Daniel is saying is when I looked at the curtain that was pulled back for me, I saw an unseen battle that affected us. We don't know much about it. That's one of the frustrating realities 
Scripture makes these statements, but it doesn't unpack the luggage, so we don't know the details. In a sense, we say we come up to this point, and beyond that, we're not sure. It's kind of like the ancient cartographers. Been waiting a long time to use that word, because I learned that word. The ancient cartographers, the map makers of the ancient world, they would sketch out the realities of this world as they understood them. And then they would come to the limits of their knowledge. And they would often write in the margins, in Latin, the words, there be dragons. We don't know what's beyond here, but there be dragons. The writer James Emery White in describing that reality, picks it up by saying this, those three words, there be dragons, were used by the medieval cartographer of the famed Lenox Globe in the 1500s to describe the outer boundaries where knowledge ended and speculation began. After drawing on all of his knowledge, the mapmaker could only write those three provocative words to convey that these areas were at best unexplored and at worst perilous. Yet maps of that era often held another image, Christ. For instance, the Psalter map around 1250, so-called because it accompanied a copy of the book of Psalms, featured dragons on the bottom as well as Jesus and the angels on the top. Such a map reminds us of the availability of true north as followers of Christ. Yes, there be dragons, but there is also Jesus and the angels, and we can follow him and find our way. And so when Daniel gets a view of that world, he realizes there is a struggle, an unseen battle that unfolds. It affects us. So our struggles are more spiritual than we might ever have thought. But there is Jesus at the top of the map. That's one insight this chapter offers. But it offers a second insight as well. This one a bit more bewildering. It offers us this. Our unanswered prayers are more complicated than we can imagine. Our unanswered prayers are more complicated than we can imagine. You know what it's like. We pray for something. Pray for it day after week, after month, after year, and for some, after decade. And we don't get our answer. And so we do, like many of the psalmists did, we come before God and we say, God, why don't you hear? When are you going to act? When are you going to do something about this? Are you going to sit up in your heaven all this time and let me suffer? That's our question. We know where responsibility lies. I prayed. You are God. You should answer. You haven't. It's simple. It's your responsibility. In a sense, we could say that's true. But then we come to Daniel 10. And something quite disturbing, quite distressing happens. Did you notice what happens in the vision, in the interaction with the being, the heavenly being? Daniel has been fasting and praying for three weeks, disturbed and distressed about what he has already seen in the vision, concerned about what this means for the future of his people and of his planet. He's been begging with God for an answer, and now the answer comes only for the being to say to him, Daniel, when you first prayed, the answer was given, and I came to bring you the answer, but... The prince of Persia resisted me for 21 days. I couldn't get through to you. I couldn't bring you that which I wanted to bring you, the answer from heaven. And so Daniel has mourned and fasted and refused to groom himself for three weeks while the heavenly agent is being resisted by the prince of Persia. Now, if that doesn't mess with your mind, I don't know what will. That draws me up short. 
I want to ask, wait a minute, what are you talking about? Are you suggesting that there might be prayers that we human beings pray which God answers, but which that spiritual struggle we just discussed somehow intercepts the answer and says, no, you can't give it? That seems to be what Daniel is told. Just a brief statement from John Goldingay, Old Testament scholar down the road from us at Fuller Theological Seminary, writing about this very incident, Goldingay says, the background to the delay offers an insight into one reason why prayers don't get answered immediately. It reminds us that it's wiser to persist in fasting and praying than to give up straight away. I will be honest with you, friends. I have more questions than answers about that. But I can tell you, I believe in prayer. I believe in God's power. And I also believe there's an unseen battle that rages about which we appear to know only small pieces. And that's why I say, the insight, second insight that grows out of this is our unanswered prayers are more complicated than we might have imagined. So who is this prince of Persia who resists the heavenly emissary? Read the words of Sidney Rydenus, another Old Testament scholar who summed it up as about as well as it can be because there are many opinions on this. Some scholars who believe it's a human being, a literal prince of Persia. I would take issue with that. Listen to how Grydonus summarizes. Most commentators today, he writes, understand the prince as a spiritual being. In 1013, the prince of the kingdom of Persia opposes the angel whom Daniel has sent to respond to Daniel's mourning and holds him up for 21 days. It is unlikely that a human being could hold up an angelic messenger for even one day. Moreover, this prince is mentioned in the same breath as Michael, one of the chief princes, later called the great prince, the protector of your people. Hence, we have to think of the prince of the kingdom of Persia as an evil angel who influences the affairs in the kingdom of Persia in opposition to God's people. As Seventh-day Adventists, we have long believed in something we have called the great conflict or the great controversy between Christ and Satan. That's what this speaks of. And that that unseen battle that rages has elements which we do not fully understand, but which we may experience in our own lives. Unanswered prayer. Or prayer to which we have not yet received an answer already given. Writer and pastor Randy Frazee writes about the time that he sat at the bedside of his extremely ill mother. She was a mere 62 years of age. Randy was still quite young. He was desperately hoping for her healing. He said, I'd, I'd, I'd like her to live to at least 80, another 18 years. Uh, my older brother has just had a daughter. I would like my mother to be able to live to see her graduate from high school. So Randy sat at her bedside there in the hospital praying, praying over and over, God, please heal her. I suppose it's one of those kinds of choices that grows out of sitting in a hospital with nothing to do but focus on an ill loved one in your prayers. And so Randy started keeping track of how many times he prayed for his mother to be healed. He said, while I sat there that day praying, I prayed 50 times for her healing. And in the middle of my praying, he said, I remembered the experience of Hezekiah in Scripture. King Hezekiah, who had become ill, who was visited by the prophet who came to him and said, Hezekiah, set your affairs in order because you will not recover from this illness. You will die. 
And the story says that Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and wept out his bitterness and anger and pled with God, please, I have been your faithful servant. Please give me more life. And God responded. The prophet returned. You've been granted 15 additional years. And so for Z says, I sat and I prayed like Hezekiah, just give her 18 more years. At the end of the day, he said she didn't get 18 more years or 18 more months or 18 more days. In fact, within less than 18 hours, she had died. And it left him with piercing questions. I read you the questions that he wrote after that experience. I had to ask myself, what's this all about? Does God not love me? Have I not served him like Hezekiah did? Did he not see my tears when I turned my face to the wall and wept bitterly? Why did God come through for Hezekiah and not for Randy Frazee? I suspect for some issue, every single one of us has prayed a similar prayer and gone through a similar time of darkness. Why? I don't pretend to have all the answers to why. Scripture does suggest some realities. That is true. One of which, one which we almost never mention, is this one. Daniel 10. The prince of Persia resisted me. Now, as we understand Scripture, that can only happen for the period in which God allows it to, that one day when the kingdom of God is fully and finally realized that His will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That we know. But for this period, the prince resisted. And so we would have to say our unanswered prayers are more complicated than we might have imagined. But do take note of this. Before the chapter ends, the answer does come. The being does appear. Daniel hears that for which he had petitioned. That leads us, in fact, to the third insight. Because when Daniel's prayer is answered, things get worse, not better. We would have to say that the third insight might be stated like this. We can face the end with much more hope than we had ever dreamed possible. We can do that. We can face the end with more hope than we had ever dreamed possible. Now, I hope you noticed as we read through the chapter, Daniel's emotional state. Did you catch that? He is in profound distress. Why is that? Well, the vision that he sees has to do with the time of the end. That little phrase, the time of the end, has only occurred once in Daniel previous to this, back in Daniel, the eighth chapter. Now it occurs four times. The time of the end, the time of the end, the time of the end, the time of the end. Time and again it happens, as though to underline and to make certain that Daniel understands this goes beyond the here and now. It will include what's about to happen to your people, but it stretches down to the very end of time as you, Daniel, and other human beings will experience it. So how does that affect him? It throws Daniel into an emotional state that is hard to describe. You heard the words. He says, I was speechless. I was overcome with anguish. I could not stand. I fell on my face. I was pulled up to my knees, trembling on my hands and knees. I could not stand. He goes, to great lengths to describe time and again just how deeply this affected him. The fear of what was to come. 
We've read it in Scripture. A time of trouble such as has never been. No wonder Daniel was terror-stricken, filled with fear. I know a little bit about that fear. Some, maybe many of you know about that fear. If you happen to grow up in the Seventh-day Adventist church or in a church focused on the coming of Christ, and you heard much preaching, Jesus is coming, he will come soon, he will come very soon, and there will be a time of trouble that will precede it. You know what it is to feel the cold, icy hand grip your heart, fear of what is to come. You can understand, Daniel, welcome to his world. We know something of that fear. We can relate to what he experiences. I have felt that fear, seen that fear, sensed that fear, even much more recently than my growing up years. I remember, as many of you do as well, I remember exactly where I was, what I was doing when the phone rang on the morning of Tuesday, September 11, 2001. Early morning, phone rang, unusual, answered the phone, a friend, turn on your television. I turned it on. And there it was. Anita and I watch slack-jawed, mouths agape at what we saw unfolding on the screen before us. The smoke billowing from that massive tower. And then we saw that plane hurtling into the tower and the fire that shot out in a huge fireball. We thought it was a replay of what had already transpired. It took us several minutes to realize, no, 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 that's not what happened before. A second plane has struck the second tower. And then we watched with you as those towers slowly crumbled into ash and smoke and debris that covered all of Manhattan. We we're already asking, who has done this? Driving on the 10 freeway to work a bit later, called a friend of mine who had not heard yet. I described to him what had happened. I still remember what he said. He said, this country will not be ever the same again. And, and I, I felt cl fear clutching me. I sensed the fear here. As we entered into conversations, as people asked questions, I remember one conversation in particular, a group of friends, good people, not particularly given to the things of church, really good people. They turned to me as a pastor, and they said, can you tell us something about this? I could hear the fear in their voice. Is this the end? Fear. Welcome to Daniel's world. He gets a vision, a glimpse of what lies ahead for his people and for his planet. And he is utterly undone by fear. And then a hand touches him. And then touches him again. And then touches him a third time. And a voice speaks to him and says, Daniel, you are highly esteemed in heaven. And then repeats it again. Daniel, you are highly esteemed in heaven. Daniel, you are at the center of heaven's heart. So Daniel, stand up. Don't be afraid. A second time, do not be afraid. Stand up. Heaven highly esteems you, Daniel. It's showing you what is to come, but not for purposes of frightening you, but for purposes of saving you and many others. And so the hand rests on him, and the voice speaks to him. 
Daniel, you are greatly beloved. Don't be afraid. (laughs) Of any insight that grows out of this chapter, let that be the one that lodges itself in your heart and in your mind, for you too are highly esteemed by heaven. Heaven too seeks to rest its hand on your shoulder and to speak to you despite all that might be up ahead of us and say to you, do not fear. You are greatly loved. Can you hear the voice of heaven saying, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I wouldn't have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you. But if I go and prepare a place, I will come again, receive you to myself, that where I am, there too will be those who are highly esteemed by heaven. It's a chapter that creates as many questions as it does answers. But we can at least say this. Most of our struggles are more spiritual than we have realized. Our unanswered prayers are more complicated than we might have imagined. But we can face the end with more peace than we might ever have dared to hope. And so the word to Daniel is the word to you. You are highly esteemed by heaven. So stand up and don't be afraid. Gracious God, we thank you for Daniel. We thank you for the experiences through which he passed. We thank you that he felt fear so that we might know it is possible to be frightened and yet believe. It is possible to struggle and yet still have heaven engage us. So, Lord, that is what we pray today. With all that swirls around us, with everything that threatens our planet, with an unseen battle going on above us, with unanswered prayers haunting within us, just let us never forget that the future can be faced with more peace than we might ever have dared hope. In Jesus' name, amen.